welcome to the international broadcast ministry of No Limits. I am Pastor Delman Coates and here at No Limits, we wanna help strengthen you, encourage you and empower you to feel God's love and to live your life without limitation. Today's message is about to begin and I wanna thank you for watching and know that I'm praying for you to hear a special word from God as you watch. I want to look at the gospel according to John chapter 11, chapter 10 rather, verse 11, where the word of the Lord Jesus says this. He says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd is the one who lays down his life for the sheep. Amen. I want to talk simply today from the thought, God will take care of you. Look at your neighbor, say, neighbor, oh neighbor, God will take care of you. One of my very good friends is one of the last of my friends to become a father. And he sent me a picture the other week of his newborn baby. They were uh, laying uh, on the sofa and his newborn baby was lying on his chest. And I looked at the photo and adoring, adoring, then the adoring smile on his face. And I couldn't help but think about the kind of world that this little baby would grow up in. When I called him to say, man, that, that baby looks so at peace on your chest. But little does this baby realize that sh what she's gotten herself into by coming into a world at such a time as this. He agreed with me and we began to discuss all of the chaos, confusion, and crises that characterize the world that we live in right now. Daily, we are inundated on the news and on social media with stories of violence and tragedy and poverty and war and not just on streets in foreign lands, I'm talking about right here at home. States right now are passing voter suppression laws and restrictions on women's bodies and laws that prevent teachers from telling the truth about America's racist history. I was in Georgia a few days ago and just in Georgia, the state legislature passed laws that prohibit teachers from talking about systemic racism. But what stood out to me in the midst of this discussion was the response of my friend about the vulnerability of his daughter. He said, Delman, there is indeed a lot of chaos in our world, but my child won't have to worry because I'm going to do whatever I have to do to take care of my baby. He went on to say that no matter how unsafe, insecure, and unstable our world seems, that he was going to be there to protect, provide for, and to be present for his baby through thick and through the thin. And as I heard his heart, it dawned on me, church, that it must be the same way with God, that the world we encounter and the issues we face today are so shocking and so traumatic and so unsettling, and yet God sits in his celestial balcony looking over it, looking down upon us, and God tells us, do not be afraid because he's going to do whatever it takes to take care of his children. In a real sense, that's the heart of this sermon in a nutshell. In, a, in the face of life's uncertainties and in the midst of, of life's ups and downs, we don't have to worry because God will take care of us. In describing himself as the good shepherd, Jesus understood that sheep are in many ways just like children. They are helpless, they are defenseless, and Without the proper supervision, they are vulnerable, and so they need a shepherd to watch over them and to take care of them and to lead them to new pastures and new places that will enable them to thrive and survive. When there is tension within the flock, it is the duty of the shepherd to bring peace. And when they are unsettled for whatever reason, it is the shepherd who steps in so that they can sleep at night. And in a world where there is so much chaos and confusion and uncertainty, as, as sheep, we need a shepherd church to step in and to let us know that everything is going to be all right. That's what Jesus is doing in our text today. We learned in verse 9 of this chapter that Jesus is the door, the gate, or the entryway that leads the sheep to green pastures. Now, Jesus says that he's not only the gate, 
but he is also the shepherd who sits at the entrance of the gate and keeps watch over his sheep so that thieves who try to come and, and steal, kill, and destroy their peace in verse 10 will not be able to get in. But this isn't just any kind of shepherd. Jesus wants them then and us now to understand that he's a unique shepherd. He is, he is a special shepherd. One, he'll do what others cannot and will not do. He is the good shepherd. He was distinguishing himself from all of the other people and places that they were inclined to turn to from help. He was trying to encourage them. He was trying to assure them that because he knew that he knew then that most of the people in their lives uh, that they could count, they could not count on. You know that there might be a lot of people in your life that you can number, but you can't count on them. And yet in our text today, Jesus was saying uh, to those looking for help and hope and healing that he is the one that they needed uh, and he is the one that they were looking for. In calling himself the good shepherd, theologians believe that Jesus has in mind the words of the psalmist found in Psalm 23. And I believe the first thing that Jesus wants them then and us now to know is that Jesus will take care of our provisions. Can the church say provisions? We all know Psalm 23 verse 1 where the psalmist says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Jesus then is situating himself within the context of that understanding to say that he will take care of our wants. Since, since sheep have needs that they are helpless and unable to meet on their own, the shepherd is the one who is able to meet those needs. Since sheep are short-sighted and cannot see that well, the shepherd makes them to lie down in green pastures. Since sheep are afraid of rushing waters, the shepherd digs a trench to create a pool of still waters and leaves the sheep there so that they can be refreshed. And since shepherd are e shepherds, sheep are easily distracted and have a tendency to wander from the flock and, they, and their anxiety keeps them constantly living on edge. The shepherd is the one who restores their soul. So Jesus is saying that if he is our shepherd, then we do not have to worry about anything. I'm talking to somebody here today. He takes us to places in life where we can find nourishment. He leads us to places where we can find peace, even in a fledging and floundering economy and an uncertain political environment with interest rates and racism on the rise. Jesus says that I will be your provider. That is why we call God Jehovah Jireh, because he is the source of everything that we need. Jesus tells us in Mark chapter 6, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you shall put on. It is not, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet their he your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more, more value than the birds. He says, which of you by worrying can add one more cubit or inch to your stature? In other words, whatever you need, Jesus says, I'm going to provide it. It's why David, it's what David had in mind when he said, I've been young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor their seed begging for bread because he was trying to underscore the fact that whatever you need, God God can provide. Whatever you're looking for, God can supply it. And in the face of circumstances that worry us in life, we must remind ourselves that God will provide. Jesus will take care of our bills, our brokenness, and our burdens. And is there anybody listening to me today who can testify on the basis of your own life that the Lord provided for you? You don't know how he did it, but he did it. Uh, you, you don't know why he did it, but some way, somehow, the Lord provided. We can be confident of that because Jesus has the capacity to deliver on what he promised. See, if I promise you a million dollars, you've got good reason to doubt whether I'll come through on that promise. 
But if Bill Gates promised you a million dollars, you can feel reasonably comfortable that he'll deliver on his promise because he's got the capacity to deliver. It is the same way with God. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Scripture says that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So whatever you need, somebody say whatever. What, if it's healing, if it's a miracle, if it's a, if it's a breakthrough, whatever you need, the Lord can provide. He can provide peace if you need peace. He can provide joy. Joy if you need to be picked up. He can provide hope if he can provide hope if you're wondering what tomorrow will bring. He can provide love if you're in a hate-filled, bigoted world. He can feel he can give you power if you feel powerless. And I think what throws many people off about this idea that the Lord will provide, uh, what throws them off is they misunderstand the word in Psalm 23 wants. See, when the psalmist says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, what he means here in the Hebrew is that you shall not be in lack or you shall not be in need. Eugene Peterson translates Psalms 23 verse 1 to say, God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. The point is that with Jesus you shall not lack for anything. You cannot think of wants in the way that we do in our capitalistic consumerist culture. This is not about wants and cars and shoes and bags. It's not, it's not about Birkin bags and, and, and fancy cars. This is not about the Lord providing you every materialistic thing that you desire. No, it is about providing you everything that you need. Paul put it best in Philippians 4, 19 when he said, that my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. See, when Jesus takes care of our needs, it may not be everything that you want. But I've discovered that there are times when God knows how to give you what you need. I've discovered that God, that everything that God gives you, it might not feel good to you. But you'll be able to look back on it later and say it was good for me. Have you ever been through a season and while you were in the season, it didn't feel good to you? But when you look back over it, you can say it was good for me. Y'all not here. I, I spoke to someone recently and she said to me that in a certain season of her life, she struggled with certain people walking out of her life. She said it didn't feel good at the time. She said it felt lonely when friends and family members that she had grown to, be, to develop a bond to were not there for her. She said she felt lonely and it felt bad. She said being rejected by people that she thought would have been supportive. And she said when that happened, she got angry with God when the persons that she liked and loved and who were supposed to be there for her were not there for her. But now, somebody say, but now. She said, now I look back on it, Reverend, and I realize that that season was a season in which God was weaning me off of the need of people to give me support and validation so I could learn how to rely on what God put inside. Y'all not here. In inside of me and on my relationship with God. She said, now, somebody say now. She said, now, if I don't hear from people, I don't fall apart. If they don't call me on Friday, I don't fall to pieces. Now, somebody say now. She says, now, when they aren't around, I don't assume that it's because I'm not worthy or because I'm not beautiful or because I'm not desirable or because I'm not attracted. Now, I understand that he that is within me is greater than these Negroes out here in the world. Now, she said, uh, it was not good to me, but when I look back over it, it was good for me. I have a God, and I want to tell someone listening uh, that you are in an uncomfortable season right now. I don't know what it is. I don't know what you're going through, but I want to tell you that this season, it might not be good to you, but it's going to be good for you. It's designed to break your codependency, and you are upset with 
God. But I promise you a year from now, you're going to look back over it and say, God, I thank you that they walked out of me. I thank you that they were not there. Have I got a witness in here today? See, when you are codependent, you get depressed. When you think that you need certain people around you, it makes you insecure. But what the shepherd does is that he steps, steps in and gives you a sense of security and, and helps you to realize that who you are is not dependent upon who's connected with you. Have I got a witness here? Because everybody you think you want, you really don't want. Have I got a witness here? Sometimes the shepherd has to do things to us that we don't like, but you'll look back over it and he'll bless you. I remember years ago, I was on a tour. This was probably 25 years ago. I was on a five-week tour in Turkey. It was in a rural section of Turkey when I was in graduate school. And one day we were having a group conversation with a shepherd there in Turkey. And I recall how that shepherd told us that sometimes he had to break the leg of the sheep to keep the sheep from going astray. <laughs> Y'all that here, sometimes the, the sheep would see something that he thought he liked. He would smell something that he thought he smelled good and he had problems every now and then with sheep that kept going after stuff because of how it looked and how it smelled. Y'all not here. And so the shepherd said that every now and then in rare occasions he would have to break the leg of the sheep and he did that not to hurt the sheep but he had to do it to help this y'all not here. I, I want to tell someone that Jesus knows what's best for us. And sometimes his methods are painful, but they are purposeful. And somebody in church today can testify that you went through a painful season. Glory to God, it wasn't good to you, but it was good for you. Jesus, Jesus will take care of our provision but he'll also take care of our protection. Jesus' audience would have been reminded of the world of the psalmist who said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to be afraid of no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they come for me. They, th th you prepare a table before me uh, in the presence of my haters, uh, in the presence of my, in you anoint my head uh, with uh, so much so that my cup ooh, starts overflowing. See, shepherds provide, but shepherds also have the responsibility to protect. See, unlike other animals, sheep don't have the ability to run very fast. They are not very agile to flee and to run whenever they are under enemy attack. All they can do is huddle together and hope that they are not the one that falls victim to the enemy. But when the shepherd is around, glory to God, sheep can rest, be confident that there is someone who can protect them from all hurt, harm, and danger. While the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, as Jesus said, Says, uh, he came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Uh, and he does that by giving us protection. Uh, somebody shout protection. <laughs> What that means to us today is uh, that if you have any concerns about any issue uh, that might arise uh, in your life, any danger that might surface or any trouble that might come or any storm uh, that might be unfolding, uh, that Jesus will protect you uh, from that storm. And here's the thing uh, I've discovered about God's uh, protection. I've discovered that God's protection is governed by his character. And one of the things you'll discover about God's character is uh, that God is uh, omnipotent, which means that God is uh, all-powerful. Uh, that means that God uh, can protect you from some stuff, but he can also protect you 
in some stuff. Have I got a witness here? See, the shepherd has the ability to keep the sheep from enemy attack with his rod and his staff. I feel my help. Somebody here knows what it's like to be facing an imminent danger, but you can thank God that God had your back. But not only can he protect you from it, God can also protect you while you're in it. Have I got a witness here? See, God does not always protect us by delivering out of us something. Sometimes he'll let you walk in it. Have I got a witness here? And enable you to have peace while you're in your storm. Have I got a witness here? Somebody in church today is in a storm right now. You got sickness in your body. You got more month at the end of your money. You got problems in your family issues uh, on your job, but you're in here praising God. Not because he kept you from it, but because he kept you in it. Have a God. The weapon got formed. Woo. See, God didn't take Daniel out of the lion's den. What he did was he locked the jaw of the lion. Y'all miss a shout. The Lord didn't take the Hebrew boys out of the fiery furnace. He just made them fireproof. So that when they went through foreclosure, so that when they went through divorce, so that when they went through the miscarriage, the divorce didn't break them. The fire didn't. Come on, I believe there are some witnesses here who can say I went through it but it didn't break me. I went through the fire, but the fire didn't stop my praying. Ah, but not only, not only does his omnipotence influence his protection, so does his omniscience. Omniscience means he knows all things. And because he knows all things, that means that God protects us from the stuff we're aware of. But then here's what shouted me. God can also protect us from stuff that we're not aware of. <laughs> okay. You remember when you were in high school? Oh, man, you had your eyes on Kevin. Kevin was like 6'3", 210, tall, dark. Y'all not here? <laughs> Come on, brothers. Y'all remember Tasha. Yeah, y'all remember Tasha? She's bad, y'all. She's like 5'8", 32, 28, 34. I mean, 36. Y'all got my point. I mean, Tasha was bad. And when you were in high school, you wanted to be with Tasha. And you wanted to be with Kevin. But you went back to your uh, high school, your 25th high school reunion, and Tasha came coming through the door, and Kevin came coming through the door, and you said, Lord, I thank you. Not for what you gave me, but have I got a witness here? You ever thank God not for what you got, but for what you didn't get? See, you really know how to praise when you can thank him for the job you didn't get. For the house, y'all not here. When you can thank him for the house you didn't get. I want you to open up your mouth and I want you to thank God that his omniscience, he saw stuff that you were asking for. He saw stuff that you were praising God for. And it kept you from. Have I got a witness here? His... He protects us by his omnipotence. He protects us by his omniscience, but he also protects us by his omnipresence. <laughs> that means he's everywhere. He's here and there all at the same time. I know that because throughout history, there is this spiritual disease that's emerged that's called hating. Yeah, hating is when you see what God is doing in your neighbor. And rather than celebrating what God is doing over there, 
you denigrated. You look at him and say, mm, she thinks she all that. Uh, she think, no, I don't think I'm all that. You think I think I'm all that. Let me get back to my sermon. But anyway, what's behind hating is the idea that a blessing for somebody else is taken away from a blessing from you. <laughs> that a house for your neighbor means that a, house, that a job for your neighbor means a job that's taken away from you. But can I tell you something? God is not a zero-sum God. There's not one pie when it comes to the blessings from God. He can see about somebody in Georgia and still come see about you in Maryland. He can rain down blessings on people in Africa and he can still rain down blessings on, he can rain down a blessing on your friend with a job and still give you a promotion. So don't hate, start celebrating. His presence over there does not prevent him from blessing you right here. Let me press on. God will take, Jesus will take care of your provision. He'll take care of your protection. But finally, this text suggests that Jesus will take care of our penalty. Jesus does something here that, it, that extends the role of the shepherd outlined in the Psalms. I actually think that this is what Jesus means when he characterizes himself as a unique or a good shepherd. What he does is, is that he adds a messianic dimension to what the shepherd does. The shepherd doesn't just provide. The shepherd doesn't just protect. He also lays down his life for the sheep. Now, you got to read down to verse 21, and there in verse 21, you'll discover that the context of chapter 10 actually is an extension of a discussion that goes back to chapter 9, and when, there in chapter 9, Jesus healed a man who was born blind. But the fake shepherds in chapter 9, the Pharisees, could not accept that the man gave Jesus the credit for the blessing that he had experienced. And the Bible says in chapter 9, verse 34, that they drove the man that had been blessed by Jesus out of the synagogue. So in chapter 10, Jesus is correcting uh, their understanding of shepherddom. Jesus is comparing himself as the good shepherd to those fake shepherds in chapter 9. And he says uh, what he says in verses 11 through 15 of chapter 10. Here's what he says. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired preachers, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and starts running away. And the roof snatches them and scatters them. The hired shepherd runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and my sheep know know me just as the father I feel like preaching just as the father knows me and I know the father I lay down my life for my sheep I've got a witness here he's distinguishing himself from the fake shepherds and he's saying that the sign that he cares for them is that he's willing to lay down his life for the sheep y'all not here they harm the sheep but Jesus helps the sheep they fleece the sheep but Jesus fights for the sheep they put the sheep down but Jesus lift the sheep up he is the good shepherd. Rather than giving life, they take life. Rather than welcoming people, they look for reasons to exclude people. He's the good shepherd. His words stand in contrast to the religious leaders of every generation. That your job, preachers, is not to fleece the flock, but to protect the flock. Have I got a witness here? And according to the theological tradition of the time, whenever sin is committed, there was a debt that was incurred that had to be paid. And the 
debt had to be paid by the shedding of blood. Have I got a witness here? This is way back in the Old Testament. They slaughtered animals whenever they came to worship so that they could get the blood and the blood would pay the penalty for the sins that were incurred. The blood, somebody say the blood. The blood was a substitute for the debt of sin owed by the person. The blood, and down through the years, people look to the blood of a slain animal to pay for the debt of sin that they owed. So Jesus is saying, I'm in a class all by myself. Ezekiel talked about false shepherds who just paired for themselves. But I am the good shepherd. The sheep would shed their blood so that the shepherd could save his life. Have I got a witness here? If a shepherd in Palestine died, it was regarded as an accident, but not so with Jesus. Jesus turned it, he reversed it. He said, you're not gonna die for me. I'm gonna die for you. Have I got a witness? I'm going to die so you don't have to die. You're not going to shed your blood for me. I'm going to shed my blood for you. Have I got a witness? And when they sung him high on Calvary's cross, when they pierced him in his side, when they put a crown of thorns on his head, and the blood came streaming down, his blood was paying a price that we could not pay. Have I got a witness? That's why the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We all deserve to die. I don't care what your position is. I don't care what your title is. We deserve to die. But when Jesus says, He's a good shepherd who lays down his life. He is telling them and us that he's going to take on himself the weight, the judgment, the penalty that we could not carry. The good shepherd lays down his life as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. Have I got a witness here? That's why we say, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Have I got a witness? Like before God delivered the Israelites from Egyptian bondage, he told them, when I see the blood, not your works, not your effort, not your sweat, not your tears, but when I see the blood, oh, y'all don't know in the South, Adam and Eve, they tried fig leaves, but that didn't work. Cain tried fruit from the field, but that didn't work. Some tried houses, others tried land, but only the blood would work. Pure blood, priceless blood, precious blood, perfect blood, powerful blood, prevailing blood could wash us. Redeem us. Have I got a witness? So no longer would blood from goats or lambs or doves work. Only the blood of Jesus. 
Caesar to pay the price that I owe. I lied. I cheated. I stole. But his blood paid the price that I couldn't pay. Have I got a witness? And is there anybody here who knows that there's power in the blood? Wonder working power. Power to redeem. Power to deliver. Power to keep you. Power to heal. Power to turn it. Turn it. Yeah! No wonder we say about the blood. Because it's blood. His blood can wash. Come on, give God praise for the blood. Come on, is there anybody here who can thank God for the blood? Hallelujah. Come on, thank him for the blood. Glory. He says, I'm going to take care of your provisions. You're not going to want. You're not going to need for anything. People might walk out on you, but you probably don't need them no way. People are going to talk about you, but it matters not what they say. He'll take care of your provisions. Woo. But he'll also take care of your protection. He'll block some stuff. But then sometimes he'll let you be in it. But you'll still be able to sleep at night. Some of you, you, didn't, you don't even know how you rested the way, the, way, the way you rested last night. With all the hell going on in your life. But some kind of way, he gave you peace in the middle of it. Have I got a witness here? God will protect you from stuff you know about. But he'll also protect you from stuff that you don't know about. You wanted a job so bad. You wanted a relationship so bad. You prayed about it. And then you read in the newspaper he was a scammer. Lord, thank you. He'll keep you from it. He'll keep you in it. He has the capacity to bless somebody over there and bless you over here. He can keep them and you all at the same time. He'll provide your provision. He'll provide your protection. But he'll also provide for your penalty. We've been, we've been running up a tab with all of the things that we've done. We've been running up the bill with the things that we've said about people, the things that we have done to people. Been running up a bill. And when you see the total, you can't pay it yourself. But Jesus said, don't worry about it. I, I'm the good shepherd. I'm not like those people in chapter 9. You're not going to have to die for me. I'm going to lay down my life for you. Somebody say, he did it for me. Somebody at home say, he did it for me. After our first year of broadcasting weekly messages here on No Limits, it is clear that the most popular way to watch the program is through our free mobile app. If you already have the free No Limits mobile app, thank you for downloading. And I hope this app helps you each day in your walk with the Lord. And if you do not have the app, what are you waiting for? You can download this app for free right now from the App Store on either your Apple or Android device. 
This app contains the weekly message I preach, as well as free resources like a daily devotion and a Bible that contains a free reading plan. Before I go, let me ask you for a favor. Please tell all of your friends about the No Limits mobile app as we want to connect with more people and help them live a life with no limits. Learn more at delmancoats.org. That's delmancoats.org. Thank you for watching the message today, and I look forward to seeing you again right here next week for another episode of No Limits. I am so glad that you took the time to watch this message today. If you have been blessed by this outreach, I'd like to ask you to become a partner in this ministry so that together we can reach the world for Jesus Christ. My heart is to reach people just like you all around the world and to tell them that God loves them and wants to empower them to live a life with no limits. Your financial investment in this ministry will enable us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ around the world so that more people can be inspired and encouraged. Will you help me to reach those people? Will you join me in empowering the lost and the forgotten? Will you be my partner as we teach people to truly live a life with no limits? To make a donation safely and securely, go to our website at delmancoats.org. That's delmancoats.org and look for the donate button on the top right of the homepage. Thank you in advance for your support and for becoming a true partner in No Limits. Your partnership and financial gift will help us impact the world by bringing hope to those who need it. Your generosity today is a reminder of the goodness of God. Thank you again for watching No Limits with Pastor Delman. The preceding program was brought to you by the faithful supporters of No Limits and Mount Enon Baptist Church in Clinton, Maryland.